Yeah, welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin Live, where your number one source for the peaceful Bitcoin revolution will occur breaking news, culture, matic warfare. We will be your guide through the separation of money and state. Uh, very interesting news coming out of China, out of Hong Kong. Hong Kong seems to be opening its arms uh, and trying to attract, uh, you know, Bitcoin and, and so-called crypto industries uh, to the city. And that tells me something that tells me that China is playing two sides. Um, at the end of the day, you know, Hong Kong is supposed to be this independent city, the so-called one country, two systems. Uh, Hong Kong was a British colony and then it was handed back to to uh, to China. And, you know, then over the last couple of years, you've heard, you know, the, the massive Hong Kong protests that, that have been happening. The CCP has been cracking down on free speech there. But it seems like they've realized that you can't stop the honey badger. So they're playing both sides on the mainland. Ban it. You know, it's, populists can't use it over there. But then Hong Kong, you know, this isolated pocket, they're, they're trying to, to uh, reap the benefits of what is going on there. And I think it would be a massive uh, a massive political blunder for the US um, if they allow uh, Bitcoin businesses, uh, you know, whatever happens to the crypto industry, fine. But if the US allowed Bitcoin industries to uh, flee overseas, uh, we had a live stream over on the Swan Bitcoin channel. We were live streaming the um, the uh, David Zell from Bitcoin Policy Institute, the Bitcoin Policy Summit, and um, Jack Maulers had a keynote. And in that keynote, he basically made two veiled threats uh, in the very beginning. He said, look, you guys better get your act together or I'll leave. Um, and in kind of like in the middle part of the speech, he said that you want uh, Bitcoiners and Bitcoin companies paying taxes in Texas and not in Dubai. And then at the Bitcoin conference, Jack Mahler said, hey, you know, we're just going to go to El Salvador. And this is a joke that Opti and I say all the time. Right. So I think the U.S. really has to get its act together. Um, it, the worst thing that could happen would be for the U.S. to lose the Bitcoin industry and for the Bitcoin industry to flee into the hands of the CCP, which is a major political opponent of the U.S., that would be a catastrophe. So, you know, but again, the, at the end of the day, you know, the whether you call it the military industrial complex, whether you call it the deep state, whether you call it the administrative state, they benefit tremendously from uh, controlling the money, whether that's being able to weaponize the dollar against political opponents. You guys remember the sanctions that, you know, they, they have been using against Cuba, against North Korea, against uh, all the countries that, you know, the... Uh, the elite uh, bureaucratic class deems enemies of the state and uh, also the benefit of being able to create money for free that everyone else has to work for. Right. So we're going to get into that. We're going to see how China is on one hand rejecting Bitcoin and the principles of Bitcoin, but also at the on the other side, uh, they're also embracing the benefits of it. So that's what we're going to cover on today. And then during the culture segment, I'm very, very excited because we have one of the best basketball players uh, in Bitcoin. We have uh, Sir Ulrich. How you doing, bro? Nico, how you doing, man? Always a pleasure to be on Simply Bitcoin uh, as I as we share the good news of this peaceful revolution. Yeah, man. Always, always super, super honored to have you. And shout out to uh, the show that you're doing with Q. What, what's the name of the show? How can people find it? The show is called Bitcoin Ballers, and it's uh, it's right now uh, hosted on Q's personal uh, YouTube channel. I think it says Running Q, Running Bitcoin Productions, uh, and we're in our 14th episode. We do it on a pretty much a weekly basis, but the catch is, is that we're talking about simply basketball. But we're Bitcoiners talking about it. And I think as Bitcoin grows, what we're going to find is that there's going to be uh, numerous uh relation uh industries relating to or not relating to bitcoin popping up 
uh, and hosted by Bitcoiners. Bitcoiners are, are the future of this world. And we're just being the, for, the forerunners of basketball podcasting uh, from a Bitcoiners perspective. Awesome. And you had another Bitcoin basketball legend on the show the other day. The one, the only Corey Clipson, CEO of Swan Bitcoin. And uh, I, w- I was popping in the chat. I was, I was hanging out with you guys. Corey is so incredibly humble, man. Corey's a, Corey's a great guy. I really, really enjoy that episode. And of course, my legendary co-host, always optimistic, wakes up with a giant smile on his face, which he doesn't have on right now. Are you texting Chrissy again? What's going on? <laughs> uh, no, I, I blocked her number. But... Uh, <laughs> Ulrich, with the optimism, man, just like I, I can't even match this optimism this morning because I just got even more optimistic about the future. So I am just hyped, uh, you know, put all that optimism straight in my in my main vein, because this is why we do what we do. Anyways, Nico, uh, let's get into this. Let's get into the show. No more delay, everybody. Let's get to the numbers. The Bitcoin Numbers. Brought to you by Noddle. At this point, you should be running your own Bitcoin node. If you don't use your own Bitcoin node, you're trusting someone else's. Run your own version of Bitcoin Core, the Lightning Network, Whirlpool, and Dojo, all from the comfort of your own home. And if you're a digital nomad, you have absolutely no excuse because now you can run a Noddle through a virtual private server. Visit noddle.eu today. All right, guys, I also want to tell you about the biggest Bitcoin conference on the face of the earth, Bitcoin 2024. That's right. It's not Bitcoin 2023. That was in Miami. Bitcoin 2024, the year of the having, is going to be in Nashville, 20, uh, Tennessee. It's going to be from July 25th through the 27th, 2024. And guys, I have a good news for you guys. You can get yourself some early bird tickets. Uh, only, for GA, it's only $2.99. For industry day, if you're trying to get a job in, in the sector, I uh, definitely recommend that pass. It's about seven forty nine. And if you're a whale, you can get the you can get a whale pass for four thousand four hundred ninety nine. These are all at a massive discount. The prices will go up. And I have good news for you guys. You could use the promo code simply to get your, uh, to get yourself an, an even bigger discount. Get yourself a ten percent discount on already these discounted prices. At the time of recording, the Bitcoin price. Speaking of discounted prices, is at twenty six thousand six hundred and sixty sats per dollar. Is at three thousand seven hundred fifty one. One. Block height, 793,421. Reachable Bitcoin nodes, 17,096. Blocks to having 46,579. Having estimate uh, April 21st, 2024. Uh, total Lightning Network capacity 5,344 Bitcoin. Capacity value 142 million US dollars. And the realized monetary inflation rate of Bitcoin 1.75%. And the market capitalization of Bitcoin. $517 billion with the B in the grand scheme of things. Bitcoin is still a tiny little baby. Anyways, guys, I, I want to cover this as a topic that uh, plays near and dear to my heart. Uh, this is something that we've been covering for quite a while now. And the concept is we are living through not only the disintermediation of money, but what started before that was the disintermediation of information. And what started that fire? It was the Internet. The Internet has given Anybody, doesn't matter where you are, if you have access to a cell phone, uh, if you have access to a computer, you can now become a broadcaster. You don't need to go through intermediaries anymore. Therefore, their ability to control the narrative. And and I'm going to reference Naim Bukele's famous article, Don't Drink the Elite's Kool-Aid. And in that article, he said that their most important weapon is their ability to control the truth. And, you know, we've talked about Tucker Carlson many times on the show. He was one of the no, if not, I think I think Hannity's had Michael Saylor on the show. But Tucker, I think, was the biggest proponent of Bitcoin. He says he's liked Bitcoin on his very, very popular show on Fox, which, you know, got canceled. Tucker got fired. And um, and I said this, he said, uh, my uh, Tucker has had Michael Saylor, he's had Naeem Bukele, he's had Max Kaiser, he's had Marty Bent on the show, and the show was getting an average of 3.5 million viewers 
per episode. Now, you can speculate as to why, you know, he was pulled off the air. You know, a lot of people were saying he was going against the counter narrative. Here is Naim Bukele basically saying that the Federal Reserve is not is not federal. Uh, there's nothing about it that, you know, that that uh, they're, they're printing money out of thin air, basically. And you know what they did to Tucker? They deplatformed him. Now, the problem that they have, though, is now we are living in the era of the Internet. And it's like I was saying before, anybody could create an account, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on YouTube. Let's say you get deplatformed off that. You can go to you can go to Rumble. You can go to Noster, where they can't even pull you off whatsoever, right? There's so many options now. So we're heading into this new era, which was actually talked about in the book, The Sovereign Individual too. And it's crazy that that thesis is playing out. So I want you guys to pay attention to 3.5 million average viewers per episodes when he was on Fox. This is Tucker's first episode when he came back and that episode currently has 104 million views uh, on, tw on Twitter. Tucker was completely uncensored here. I think it's just a matter of time before he starts bringing on Bitcoiners back onto his show. Now, what's really interesting about this is that uh, Fox actually sued him uh, for for making this episode because apparently Tucker is still under contract at Fox. So they fire him, they take off his show, and at the same time, they don't want him to speak. Interesting how that works. Now, the reason that this is so influential, I'm going to pull up. Uh, this uh, this tweet by Bitcoin News, the, the great news aggregator on Twitter, and uh, this is this is the theory of the case. We've been making this case for months now, and RFK Jr., which had an amazing speech at Bitcoin 2023, basically saying, "Hey, if you elect me, I will protect your right to self custody. I will protect your right to run uh, run a node." But RFK Jr. said the quiet part out loud on Jordan Peterson's podcast. He said podcasts will determine the 2024 election and this is a continuation of the trend the legacy corporate media is no longer the mainstream media we the people are the mainstream media now so in this clip rfk jr i'll, I'll play it for you guys it's about a one minute and 35 seconds if i talked about what i was thinking about it would have i would have been deplatformed but once elon took over i started you know they 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 unshackled me and um, but also, I think this is going to be this year is going to be the political campaign uh, that will be decided on by podcasts, and particularly because the candidates are not wanting to debate. So I not only not, not only is Biden not debating, but I think Trump may not debate. Um, and uh, um, so I think people like me are going to end up going to, are going to, you know, we're going to really test whether the, these podcasts, and, you know, I was talking about, uh, about Tucker having 4.5 million nightly views. Well, the, the, the podcast that Joe Rogan did with Peter McCulloch, Got forty million views. So that, right, so, right. Yeah. So, well, Rogan's a force of nature. Yeah. So Tucker is ten times what CNN is. You know, gets and and a Rogan's audience is potentially ten times what Tucker was getting. And now, right? What I was saying. Now that Tucker is not even on corporate media anymore. Now he's getting 104 million views when he's uploading directly and he has no masters now, right? So it's very, very interesting how, you know, we're witnessing firsthand this disintermediation of information. And then what we're going to cover uh, during the news sec, uh, during the news section is the, also the disintermediation of money, right? So these two things are happening and they completely, it's like they change the power structures completely. They change the power dynamics completely. It takes away their ability to control the narrative and also takes away their ability to control the money. Of course, the system's going to fight back. Of course, the system's freaking out, right? Anyways, I want to get uh, uh, Ulrich's thoughts on this. Uh, this is some crazy stuff, man. What a, what a crazy time to be alive. You know, he said maybe 2024 is going to be decided by a podcast. Maybe that's a little bit too early, but I'll tell you this for sure. By the time the 2028 election happens, I don't think I don't think the legacy corporate media is going to have any influence. It's going to be a shadow of its former self. And the reason for that is simple. 
the continuation of lies. It's just lie after lie after lie. If they didn't lie, people wouldn't be seeking alternative information sources. Just as governments, if governments didn't print and therefore devalue people's money, people wouldn't be seeking an alternative, right? People are seeking an alternative because they're seeking the truth, whether that's seeking the truth in information or seeking the truth in money. Anyways, Ulrich, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, you know, there is a the problem with with big institutions that are made up of essentially money printing, sitting on their wealth, not creating value, is that they're not innovative. Um, and we saw that when in elections in the past, when the television was was get, gaining gaining audience, gaining uh, adoption, and the people who didn't know how to uh, leverage the, that new technology, they fell behind. Um, and now you have this the internet dynamic where you have, and not centralized, but like a television or a radio, but now you have all different types of people in, uh, participating in this protocol, enabling themselves to be heard uh, without, with very, with a lot less power to censor. Um, lo legacy institutions, they don't want you to adopt new technologies because that would inc that would require them to context shift. That would require them to to innovate. Uh, and we live in a proof of stake society, and proof of stake is not an innovative system. So, in my opinion, I do agree with you, Nico, that podcasts are going to play a part. It may not be the be all end all yet, but uh, Decentralized information is rapidly evolving, just like decentralized money. And in the time frame, it's in the time frame that we're looking at. We're a year and a half away from the next election. Uh, it could play a major part. But then we're five and a half years from the election after that. Uh, you ain't seen nothing yet. Yeah, a hundred percent. And so many things are going to change so rapidly in this decade, right? Um, and it, so like I said, what a, what a crazy time to be alive, protect yourself, seek your own information, take a bit of personal responsibility. Don't outsource uh, the storage of your wealth and don't outsource your, uh, your, your information. Seek, seek, do your own research, seek your own truth, right? Uh, find the truth yourself. Stop relying on people that have consistently abused, uh, you know, that that privilege that they had, because these are institutions that, you know, we were supposed to trust. Right. We were supposed that was all about it. It's like we, we, we have journalistic integrity. You have to trust us. We're reliable sources. But they have they have continued to abuse that trust for their own financial gains and for their own political gains as well. Anyways, Opti, uh, what are your thoughts on this, bro? Well, first off, uh, Nico and Ulrich, I am very disappointed with your uh, your double speak and your lack of trusting the experts. Uh, trust the science. Now, obviously, I'm trying. <laughs> Sorry, too much so sarcasm. Highly regarded. <laughs> too much sarcasm for, for most people here. Uh, first and foremost, now, 104 million views on that Twitter post by Tucker Carlson. That's absolutely insane. I haven't watched that episode yet, but I've seen a lot of people talking about it. So I think at this point, I might have to put my my one view on that 104 million views. But I think it's something we've been talking about here for a while. And I think anyone that is on Twitter or on any of these social media platforms is, is understanding or at least starting to understand. And that's the importance of content creators. And I think the real conversations, the real everyday conversations is happening on whether it's the Joe Rogan podcast or, you know, all of our friends podcasts or anyone that has a podcast like this is where the real conversation is happening and it's not happening on the corporate press because i don't know anyone around my age or through my friends that still watch the tv i know my parents might still watch the cable network television but most people are on the internet whether that is just through twitter or through rumble or through youtube yes they're probably still watching netflix but the conversation is being had on an individual level through these various mediums and uh what did carlos matos say of bitconnect uh we no longer live in the world we once did and i think this is becoming truer and truer every single day 
And I really do believe, and I, this might be naive and I might be just looking into things, but it really does feel like peak, peak centralization of information uh, has passed us. And now we are seeing the pendulum swing towards this decentralization or, or the disintermediation of information. And I, and I don't mean to like use buzzwords, but it really does feel that the conversation is happening on an individual level and we're just playing the telephone game until everyone realizes what the musical chairs game is actually happening in real time. And that is, of course, the fiat system is stealing from you and you should be saving in something like Bitcoin or rather you should be saving in Bitcoin. And of course, the corporate press hates this and you just love to see it. It just it makes me know that we are on the right path, us and the, the viewer over here, that what we are doing is correct and just continue to double down and understand that the power is shifting towards the individual and to remember that the corporate press and the government probably doesn't have as much power as you think they do and to not fear them because we have the freedom tools today and that is taking Bitcoin into self-custody. It is running Noster. It is running your own node. It is protecting yourself because you can't expect someone else to protect you when they are incentivized to literally steal from you, to hurt you and to take your resources. So we have the power today and it's just it makes me very bullish and optimistic about the future. And this is why I'm a Bitcoiner and this is why we show up every single day to continue to spread this message to people because the Overton window is still in the corporate press right now. And, and most people still feel like they have no option. They have no escape. And all of us Bitcoiners are, are yelling at the top of our lungs to explain to people, sometimes probably not in the most eloquent way that, hey, we have the tools. We can escape this. We can opt out right now. And it just it's just a matter of time until everyone wakes up and literally drops the fiat system overnight. Well, obviously over time, but we have the tools today and uh, it's upon every individual that is a Bitcoiner, like Ulrich was saying, you know, whether that's talking about Bitcoin or basketball, because everything is basketball, right? Big Sean Harris and um, explaining that, look, we have other spheres of influences around us. We have other interests, but it really does start with the money and the money is broken and few people understand this. And it's obviously designed that way because the power comes from the money. And if you can defund the money, then all the crazy stuff that we don't like literally stops happening because they don't have money to fund it. So it does start with the money. Obviously, it's a lot bigger than just the money, but we got to start somewhere and we have the tools. It is Bitcoin. It is Bitcoin, exactly. Yes, and this is how we'll win. Anyways, everybody, no more delay. Let's jump straight into the news. We got a lot to talk about. Let's check it out. The Daily News. The Daily News is brought to you by Blockstream Jade, built by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. It's an open source hardware wallet for the cold storage of Bitcoin. Check out the brand new limited edition color, the transparent green jade. Blockstream Jade houses a full color camera, allowing for fully air gap Bitcoin transactions, scan and display QR codes directly on the device, assign transactions and verify addresses with ease. Use your Blockstream Jade with your favorite wallet software, such as Blockstream Green, Blue Wallet, Electrum, Sparrow. Get yourself a Blockstream Jade today and take self custody of your Bitcoin. All right, guys, I also want to give a shout out to the Orange Pill app. It's building the social layer for Bitcoin. As crazy as this sounds, without the people, Bitcoin is just ones and zeros. Bitcoin is the people. Bitcoin is you. It's me. It's Opti. It's Satoshi. Download the Orange Pill app for iOS or Android and connect with other Bitcoiners in real life today. Find other plebs that live near you, or you can even go into the, or, or, uh, into the app totally anon and search for other Bitcoiners by common interest. Orange Pill app is also the world's biggest repository for Bitcoin only events. If you want to meet other Bitcoiners in real life, this is the app for you. Sign up through the app store and you can even pay in sats. And also Opti and I appreciate all the message, all the messages that we are getting and we try to answer each and every one of them. Anyways, everybody, let's get to uh, let's get to the big news for today. Uh, this is something that we've been covering for quite a while, uh, a bit of an update, but I'm going to try to break down the whole situation and then get everyone's thoughts on this. So, um, you know, we all know that we all know how the CCP uh, feels about Bitcoin. We all know that they ban Bitcoin. Um, they ban Bitcoin and they ban Bitcoin miners uh, within their borders that that uh, led to the hash rate drop. 
Um, but, uh, you know, you, you can't really kill the honey badger. Um, anyways, so this is an article from Bloomberg. Uh, the name of the article for audio listeners is Hong Kong's crypto, ambit- crypto hub ambitions win quiet backing from Beijing. It goes on to say in October, Hong Kong rolled out the red carpet for crypto businesses to help revitalize the embattled financial hub. Signs are now emerging that the push has under the radar backing from Beijing, providing uh, impetus for mainland Chinese firms to return. Representatives from China's liaison office and other officials have been a frequent guest at the city's crypto gatherings over the past months, swapping business cards and WeChat details, said people familiar with the matter who asked not to be named discussing private information. The encounters have been friendly with officials checking checking on developments, asking for reports and some some cases making follow-up calls the people said uh, the people said the liaison office the top mainland body based in Hong Kong didn't respond to a request for comment local crypto operators said their presence is clearing up any doubts about Beijing's attitude towards Hong Kong's efforts to become a crypto hub the low-key support shows that officials are keen on using the laissez fair city as a testing ground for digital assets as they keep a tight rein on any such activity on the mainland so they are literally playing both sides, right? In the mainland, they want total totalitarian control, social credit system, uh, central bank digital currencies, and then they're using Hong Kong as this isolated testing ground, right? Uh, so it's just it's just so fascinating. Anyways, mainland and overseas, fir- overseas firms are taking the cue, pushing to register their businesses and planning a return to the Chinese territory 15 months after Beijing slapped a ban on the industry and forced many to set up shop abroad. Quote, as long as one doesn't violate the bottom line to not threaten, quote, we've heard this before, This we've heard this term before from other central banks, quote, financial stability in China Hong Kong is free to explore its own its own pursuit under one country two systems, um, and I'm going to kind of take it back a little bit and talk about you know the the China ban that happened. Right, we all remember this. Uh, this happened in the 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 middle of the last bull market. I've made a theory. I've I've theorized that this was an attack on Bitcoin's price. Uh, here is this great chart uh, from Blockchain.com. And it literally shows the Bitcoin price. And in blue, it shows the hash rate. And as you can see, literally the hash rate fell as the Bitcoin price fell as well. And why is that? Well, a lot of miners had to sell Bitcoin, had to sell their Bitcoin in order to relocate overseas. And my theory of the case is that I think that this neutered the last bull market. I think this is the reason that we didn't hit a, we didn't hit 100K. And again, it's a big coincidence that this happened, uh, you know, in, in, in literally while the price was going parabolic like it tends to do every halving cycle or so but the thing is you can't stop bitcoin's incentives and what what makes me so bullish about this is that even in one of the most powerful nation states in the world with this total totalitarian control over the country uh it still seems like people are mining Bitcoin in China. Here's an article by, uh, this this isn't by Mackenzie Scalos, but it goes on to say, Bitcoin production roars back in China despite Beijing's ban on crypto mining. And here is a a, a graphic from the University of Cambridge. And if you go by each individual country, it tells you how much of the hash rate is located in that country. So, you know, once the China ban happened, a lot of those Bitcoin miners, they migrated to the United States. A lot of them went to Texas. But even even with the ban still in place, it's estimated that 21 percent of the hash rate is still located in China. And why is that? You can't stop Bitcoin's incentives, right? People want to profit. That's the that's the whole point about it. And now it kind of starts to make sense as to why China is deciding to play both sides. You think they walked it back coincidentally? No, they realized it's like, wait, we can't make this thing go away. We can't miss on this opportunity. So we're going to use this, uh, you know, uh, one country, two systems Hong Kong isolated from the ra- uh, the rest of the mainland to try to take the benefits away f- uh, benefits from Bitcoin, but at the same time trying to you know isolate it from the rest of the populace. But as Alex Gladstein said in this really great article that I recommend for you guys, Bitcoin is a Trojan horse for freedom. Freedom 
and number go up technology, they're inextricably linked. You can't separate them. You can't benefit from the NGU and take away the freedom. Anyway, so it goes on to say, and this is an update from uh, from the article that I previously read. It says Hong Kong's crypto ambitions get a guarded reception from digital asset companies. It goes on to say Hong Kong kicked off a new crypto regulatory regime in a bid to uh, nurture a digital asset hub, a pivot that stirred interest but has yet to win big investment pledges from an industry chastened by a market route last year. The rules apply from Thursday and let crypto exchanges offer trading services to individuals and institutions if they secure and comply with licenses designed to shield investors from the risky practices exposed in the 2022 crash. The framework, months in the making, a rolling out just as crypto firms score, uh, scored, the, scored the earth for suitable bases amid a crackdown in the U.S., jurisdictions like Hong Kong and Dubai, that's very interesting because that's what Jack Mahler's mentioned in his keynote speech in uh, in the Imperial City of Washington, D.C., are seeking to attract companies. While Singapore plans to curb on retail investor participation, the European Union in April approved the most comprehensive digital asset rules of any developed con uh, economy. It goes on to say Hong Kong telegraphed the policy shift last year as part of an effort to restore its image as a Cutting edge financial center, the city offers not just lo not just a local market, but also a conduit to Chinese wealth. Particularly if Beijing even loosens a 20 month old ban on crypto trading on, on, on the on the mainland. Yet 50 major digital asset outfits, including exchanges, crypto lead, uh, lenders, and stablecoin issuers, refrain from elaborating on specific investment plans for Hong Kong when asked about them uh, by Bloomberg News. The exchanges included the likes of. Binance Binance, what in this article was written before what happened with Binance on Monday, they got sued by the SEC. Coinbase, what happened with Coinbase on Tuesday, they got sued by the SEC. Quote, potential investors are proceeding conservatively and setting up uh, virtual asset trading platforms in Hong Kong. It goes on to say um, they want to be sure that they don't end up burning cash. And I, I don't blame them. But at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep doubling down on this. I know that the U.S. is only going after so-called crypto companies right now. Uh, but I also think that the U.S. is at risk of losing Bitcoin companies. I mean, Jack Mahler's strike already jumped ship. The El Salvador law looks amazing. Uh, zero, I think it's like 0% income tax for technology companies in the sector. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think the U.S. is playing with fire. I think that the this geographical advantage that they once had where it's like you had to be uh, you had to be based in the country you're doing business. I think when it comes to Bitcoin, when it comes to the Internet, when it comes to cyberspace, uh, borders don't really matter. Right. So people are just going to go and companies are just going to go where they're treated best. Right. And then what happens when jurisdictions compete? Well, it's very similar to what happens when companies compete for customers business. It forces them to innovate. It forces them to come up with better products. Right. And I think eventually the theory from the sovereign individual is going to come true. I think eventually over time, information technologies are going to force governments to, you know, change this relationship from this relationship that exists today, where it's just kind of like this extortion model to a more business slash customer model. And I think we're already seeing that. That's not that's not a theory anymore. I think we're seeing it firsthand in the country of El Salvador already. Uh, we had a uh, we had the national security advisor of El Salvador, Alejandro, on Simply Bitcoin IRL yesterday. And man, oh, man, when he, when he was talking about cleaning up the streets and, you know, about the the promising future of El Salvador, it was just absolutely inspiring. So I really hope that the U.S. gets its act together. You know, right now they are going after, you know, so-called crypto companies. But there was a very troubling uh, statement made by Gary Gensler also when he did an interview for Squawk Box on Monday morning. He said that they, we don't need any more digital currencies uh, we already have digital currencies, and those digital currencies are the digital dollar, the digital euro, and the yuan, right? So, you know, that was very troubling language. I'm I'm a skeptical, paranoid Bitcoiner, right? It's like they're going after, you know, these securities. They have the ammunition. FTX absolutely embarrassed a lot of these regulators. 
But who's to say, you know, that they're not going to turn their their crosshairs on, onto Bitcoin, right? So that's, you know, the jury is still out on that at the moment, but uh, let's see how this develops. Anyways, Ulrich, I want to get your thoughts on this and then we'll move on to Opti. Yeah, I mean, Nico, that, that riff was so on point. I mean, you mentioned uh, in using the language that you did to to show how the fr Bitcoin pushes us into a free market by hook or crook. Like you don't have any options because no one can control the money supply. So when you talk about jurisdictional arbitrage, which is essentially uh, the competition for uh, value creators all over the world, what are what are countries? What are the what is the state going to do to make sure that they have people? in their domain that are creating value for their own uh, for their own uh, place on this planet. Uh, I think that you see with the China, with China obviously coming back into the fold of the Bitcoin industry, what do you say to to what happened in 2021? A lot of normies would, would go the 1984 route and just simply forget because it wasn't within the last 12 months or six months uh but what you see there with china is like bitcoin bitcoin is essentially bigger than china i know it sounds crazy to say that but when people talk about well what if you just ban bitcoin the second strongest country in the world essentially banned it flat out and they realized short in short order that wow we can't f with this thing uh let's let's refocus let's reorganize and let's try to get ahead of this uh and some people could say maybe they're them banning it was just an attempt to front run a price a price run dip the price so that they can buy in so that they can get a cheaper cheaper uh position in in the system whatever it may be there is no argument saying that bitcoin can just be banned if the united states were to ban bitcoin like they were trying to maybe tax it out of existence in Texas, um, Arkansas or North Dakota would just say, "Hey, we'll we'll take your miners." Uh, Bitcoin, no one's bigger than in, than their incentives, and the biggest incentive in this world right now is to acquire bi as much Bitcoin as possible and to get your place in this new economic environment that's coming quickly. And just like you talked about the disintermediation disinter of information, Bitcoin is the manifestation of the disintermediation of money. And a lot of people don't want that to happen. And the sad thing about the normies in this world is that they're listening to those people with the loud megaphones than us uh, in the Bitcoin space. So thankfully, we have people like Simply Bitcoin. We have other other podcasts out there um that are spreading the good news because this good news is for the common man and the elite uh current establishment is going to get wrecked for every minute that they uh that they ignore this movement that's happening right now 100 percent, i agree and you, you can't stop this you know you can't stop this you you talk you're talking about jurisdictional arbitrage you know the the this uh the theory of the better flag theory Right. You know, you're, you're just going to go to where you're treated best, you know, and I think that over time you're going to see that trend accelerate. Hopefully, you know, the uh, hopefully the U.S. doesn't shoot itself in the foot here, uh, you know, because it, it would. Could you imagine if uh, the U.S. pushes some I don't care about the crypto companies, but could you imagine if the U.S. pushes some of these Bitcoin companies to Hong Kong, literally puts them in the hands of the CCP? Like, could you imagine what what that blunder would be like, you know, in, in the pursuit of of them trying to roll out these CBDCs. And we've talked a lot about CBDCs on this show tremendously. Look, the only thing governments have left is coercion, right? They have to coerce people into using CBDCs, right? Bitcoin has incentives. We don't want more efficient payments. What we want is we want to be able to use a money that does not steal from us. We want to use a money that doesn't lose purchasing power. It isn't designed to lose purchasing power. And that's something that all these politicians, whether you know it's the, the White House report or you know the report that came out of the Treasury, they don't mention inflation. They don't, they don't even, they don't, they don't even they, they, they don't even give it the light of day. And and I believe that they don't mention it is because I don't think that they can defend that position. The mere fact that a currency can exist, right? That is not inflationary. In fact, it's deflationary in nature. 
it's a big problem for them, right? Um, anyways, Opti, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, first, uh, I wanted to touch on what Ulrich said at the end. Is I, I say it all the time. It's kind of like a troll. Like, have you heard the good word of Satoshi? But, like, it really does feel like that when you are a Bitcoiner. And then on the next point, uh, to Nico's point, I was going to bring this up as a meme, but I think it's a little more fitting if I bring it up right now. Uh, this is a meme by Coinbeast, and it goes, the Bitcoin hash rate has increased by over 300% since the largest nation state in the world tried to ban it in 2021. And you can see the hash rate going from 86 tera hashes to 370 tera hashes. And it's just, it's, it's so beautiful as a Bitcoiner, because what do we say? Uh, all the time on this show, like you can't ban yourself from Bitcoin or you can't ban Bitcoin. You can only ban yourself from the benefits of Bitcoin and using Bitcoin literally means like you can't control me. And that's such a powerful chess move that terrifies the central planners. It terrifies the people that back the money printer. And what's the height quote? You know, the only way to take back your power is by building a parallel system that they cannot control. And we are seeing continuous receipts that this is the case. And of course, there's people out there that will try to gaslight the individual that will try to uh, connect Bitcoin and crypto, something that can be co-opted. And just Bitcoin keeps chugging along this TikTok next block. And it's just a beautiful thing to be a part of because the world still doesn't understand. And I say it all the time that we have the freedom tools today. Like we have the exit route. And what Chrissy Lagarde say all the time, you know, if there's an exit, people will use it. Well, people are using it. And this is why they continuously try to make hit pieces, make Bitcoin obituaries, write all the pro propaganda they can, create all the propaganda they can to stop Bitcoin adoption. But it's becoming very clear that even the country that tried to ban Bitcoin, aka China, loves Bitcoin. They just got to do it in a way where they can't endorse it. And I really like what Ulrich said, because I've said this in the past as well. It's almost like they are doing the same playbook that every other uh, big person has done, big uh skeptic of bitcoin has done it's you fud bitcoin you pack your bags and then you endorse it as it starts going up and you're like oh my god i love bitcoin and then the price just continues to explode obviously we're at that point in the bear market where no good news will move the price but you know a little bit of bad news will maybe move the price a little lower and this is i think where we are just like fud the bag so that you can pack it up and then finally at the very end of the bear market you're like I love Bitcoin. Let's fully endorse this. And it just takes <laughs> off to the moon. So, hey, for you guys that continuously stack during the bear market, you know, shouts out to you. And I think this next year or two is going to be a very beautiful sight as Bitcoin hits another bull run. So, hey, bullish. Obviously, we're not here to endorse China, but it is very It's a warning. It's yeah, a warning, exactly. bro. It's a warning. It's a warning. What, what is happening in Hong Kong is a warning. What Jack, Do uh, sorry, what Jack Mahler said at, literally, he told it, he said it in the in D.C., like where these decisions are, are, are being made. He literally said it. If you guys don't get your act together, I will leave. And then what happened in the Bitcoin conference? We're going to go to El Salvador, right? And, and this, is the, this is the crazy part. It's like, do you want Bitcoiners paying taxes in Dubai? Do you want Bitcoiners paying taxes in Hong Kong? Do you want Bitcoiners paying taxes to the CCP? Or do you want Bitcoiners staying in your country, in your jurisdiction, right? The, 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 this is nuts. You're, you're not going to make this go away. Look, whatever happens to the crypto companies, so be it. You know, so be it. I, I, I don't care. But what worries me is a lot of people don't know the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. And we know that there's very hostile people, including the Biden administration, including politicians that have uh, huge followings like Elizabeth Warren. We know how they feel about this industry. And you're just going to make the future wealthiest generation, and in, in, in my opinion, also one of the most influential, uh, the, the, the most some of the most... Some of the most influential and wealthy people over the next decade or two are going to be Bitcoiners. And what a disaster would that be to make those people leave, right? Uh, to potentially your enemy's hands, right? That would be terrible. Anyway, so that's a warning. And I'll say it from Simply Bitcoin's side as well, right? Opti and I, we're going to try to hold it down. You know, we're first generation Americans. We, we love this country and, you know, what the original ethos represented. But yeah, if shit hits the fan here, uh, opti, uh, simply Bitcoin's going to El Salvador. We will leave, 
right? Um, anyways, everybody, speaking of this giant, uh, crazy, crazy world and, you know, times that we're living through, you want to make it over the finish line with your generational wealth. And that's why you should be securing your Bitcoin wallet, backup seed words and passphrases. You want to be securing it not on not on paper you want to be securing it on steel and there's no better place to do it than the bit plates domino it's they're easy to use hard to destroy they're designed to preserve bitcoin wallet backup seed words and passphrases it's made from highly coercion resistant 316 marine grade stainless steel and it offers the ultimate protection against extremes of temperatures you can use the promo code simply to get yourself a 10% discount anyways everybody let's get to the culture The Daily Culture. Brought to you by SwanBitcoin.com. Swan is the best way to build your Bitcoin stack with automated Bitcoin savings plans and instant purchases, serving clients of any size from $10 to $10 million. We love Swan because they incentivize self custody and dollar cost averaging. What are you waiting for? Visit SwanBitcoin.com today. All right, guys, I also want to tell you about Swan's new offer. Bitcoin Bitcoin is generational wealth, and you can secure your bright orange future with the Swan IRA. Real Bitcoin, no taxes. Swan offers both traditional and Roth options to best fit your needs. Create your IRA and start adding Bitcoin in less than one minute. Transfers and rollovers are available. Swan's Bitcoin experts will get you set up with no transfer fees and no minimum balance requirements. This is real Bitcoin, not an ETF or other derivative. Get the real thing and get it at Swan. Go to swan.com slash IRA for more details and of course if you need questions doubts or concerns you can hit me up on twitter dm anyways opti uh what are we going to talk talk about today during the culture segment my friend yeah of course uh well we got our boy sir Ulrich back on the show last time he came on he gave us some epic rants and i absolutely appreciate it but we did have a this conversation when we were in miami and um I just kind of wanted to touch on this and and then I got some other stuff from from what you've been talking about Ulrich and I have this tweet here you just did a podcast and there's a very very great little quote you put here and uh what it means to me to contribute your time in Bitcoin so what does it mean for you to contribute to Bitcoin uh we did have a kind of the loose conversation in the beginning before we went live and uh, I think it's a very interesting story that you have you have a very interesting takes all the time but uh what's uh why why do you spend so much time talking about bitcoin why do you want people to hear about bitcoin what is your uh your prime motive yeah uh you know opti i you know there's this thing about Bit the bitcoin industry a lot of people say like how can i go work in the bitcoin industry people are trying to go get bitcoin jobs and uh and that's good for some people uh for others you know we have a lot of people that work that have their careers that have spent years you know establishing themselves in in the careers that they have and i'm one of those people i have a good job and i love my job um and regardless of what i do during the day it doesn't preclude me from the rest of my time and i think what bitcoin has done for me it is it is narrowed my scope in a good way to say, okay, my eight to four, eight to five is done. What am I doing with the rest of my time? And some people go watch Netflix. Some people go drink at the bars and, and kind of, I, I don't want to say waste their time away because that Netflix time could be with their families or the bars could be with their friends, but I've chosen to allocate a bit of my time out of my work uh, to, to learn and to teach. And so learning about Bitcoin has encouraged me to get back into programming where computer engineering background got away from coding for years. And now I'm starting to learn coding again. Uh, I became a writer. I've published 14, 15 articles with, with Bitcoin Magazine, Swan, Satoshi's Journal, and uh, Pleb Underground's about to release one of mine. Uh, uh, thank God for Bitcoin is about to release too, but I'm an engineer by trade. Why am I writing about ethics and and economics and real estate? 
Well, it's because of me learning about Bitcoin and how it applies to the rest of the world. It has caused me to say, hey, these thoughts are important. Other people should see this perspective. And so I'm enabling myself to contribute to the world in ways that I never thought I could by just having my regular day job. Uh, I think that's a very important facet where Bitcoin creates polymath. So I learned about that word. Listening to Max and Stacy talk about all the bright people in the Bitcoin world, um, you know, and I think that right now, every day that we bring another person into Bitcoin, that could be the next person that convinces another 10 people. And those 10 people could be the next person, could be the next people that convince another 100 people. So we have this potential to disciple taking words from from religious or christian backgrounds we can teach people in a in an individual way and that can grow exponentially and we could be contributors to uh bitcoin hyper uh hyper bitcoinization uh in a grassroots sort of way if we value our time and so i think i'm do, I'm on that path, and it's a in the payment. I like like I told Opti, I don't care if I earn a single sat. I've been comped a, a, a conference ticket here or there, but it's really about the value that I bring to others and saying, "Hey, this impacted me," uh, and that's all I need. <laughs> Absolutely love it, bro. Absolutely love it. Very inspiring. And also, uh, you did mention about your writings, and I found this article uh, that you did got published on Swan, but I think it's very interesting, at least the premise, because Nico and I talk about this all the time, whether it's on the show or privately. And um, you basically TLDR'd this in the tweet. It's like the mindsets that will slow Bitcoin adoption. So can you TLDR us what this article is? Give people some sneak sneak uh, teasers so that they can go and read the whole thing. What are you talking about here? And maybe even just touch on a few of them that you've seen prevalent in the community. Yeah, you know, something about my writing is that I go out into my little world and I interact with people, um, whether it's the closest people or someone from afar, and I hear how they how they approach life, how they approach Bitcoin, how they approach me, and I use that as fuel for my articles. And uh, this one, most recently, uh, hearing a lot of my friends talk about what CBDCs mean to them, what uh, what hyper bitcoinization means and what bitcoin means uh to them for the rest of the world or how the world should be uh perceiving bitcoin and not to say that they are outright wrong or or dummies or or not bitcoiners but it just i wanted to critique their perspectives a little bit i chose i chose three abstract personas i throw a little picture next to them to try to describe how they are how they are presenting themselves and i just say okay if you have this perspective what then and one of one of the perspectives i'll only uh uh touch on one of them was the idea of slowing uh the adoption of uh hyper of uh, bitcoin to the world um could be related to how many politicians or philosophers in the times of the mid 1800s were talking about slowing the uh slowing the slowing the the free freeing of the slaves if you will uh and there was a gosh you know i i wrote this article but basically the uh, the idea of gradualism uh is accepting the status quo in perpetuity and the only way to promote true change is to promote immediate change uh and i i quoted the abolition uh the abolitionist philosopher i forget his name off the top of my head don't have my article here but all the more incentive to read my article <laughs> but i've quoted him a few times in my past articles and it's very important that when we want to change society that we don't uh, that we don't accept the innate sin or the innate evil that is in the thing that we are trying to change. Evil should be immediately removed uh, because if we 
advocate for a gradual removal of it, there will be all different types of forces out of our control that will keep that evil in place. So when we talk about Bitcoin, we should be theorizing, and, or, and when I say should, some people say we shouldn't do anything, but I advocate for that we should talk about ways to immediately bring about usage and savings and uh, applicable applicability of Bitcoin to our everyday lives right now, immediately. Absolutely love it. Yeah, I've been kind of beating the same drum of if when we're talking about Bitcoin, I think the most important thing we can be talking about is explaining to people how this technology can improve your life today. And I think that's like a very powerful message. Like everyone wants to live a good life. And, you know, you can get into the details and all, all the, you know, inflation and, and the banks and the fiat world. And it's just like, look, just save in Bitcoin, hold it, go live your life, provide value, and you will be living a better life in time. Also, we did kind of touch on this in the beginning, uh, actually, before we were live. And it's uh, this idea that you I know you're working on an article. It's going to be on this this premise here. It's the how Bitcoin is a mechanism for peace and demon demonetizes war. And I. I it seems so obvious to me, but it, there's still people that don't get how this works. So can you touch on this real quick? And then uh, we'll talk about Bitcoin ballers before we roll this one out. Uh, yeah, I just feel like uh, war in it and how it has been um, manifest in the, at least the 20th century, uh, 21st century has been a has been a derivative of fiat, has been a derivative of monetary printing. Uh, war has drifted to what would what I would say is a war of ideals as opposed to war for resources or land. And the problem with ideas and ideals and 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 philosophies, when you war over those things, there is no clear ending to them. So when you have a war that's that's based on th things that can't be, written down, or I'm sorry, things that can be delineated in sand, th delineated in the ground, couple that with the ability to propagate war endlessly or propagate your your values, your incentives endlessly through money printing. And what you have is more carnage, more collateral damage, uh, more innocence getting hurt. When you bring war into a hard money system, a true hard money system, uh, you've realized quickly that a war for subjectivities is a is a costly effort. And so I do believe that when we bring Bitcoin into existence at a global scale, impacting the world, impacting everything, all political movement, what you will have is politicians will count their costs, um, war, uh, people who would warmonger would count their costs it's like you know if i pursue this war uh i don't have a a weaponized money that can keep that war going so i better have a really really good reason for attacking these people uh or it's going to cost me and it could cost me everything and the, and the when you think about the other side um the incentives for war or the incentives for arming yourself bitcoin encourages uh, defensive structures, defensive movements. Uh, Michael Saylor even talked about how, you know, the the greatest war machines or the greatest me mechanisms in in history were defensive in nature, uh, because you just just can't kill anything that's indestructible. And he, of course, compared that to Bitcoin. I do feel like, from a warring perspective, that um, the priorities would be on defensive maneuvers, defensive, uh, defensive uh, capabilities, weapon systems. So that will encourage people to say, hey, if I'm going to build a weapon to fight, to kill, I'm going to build one that will defend my land, defend my sovereignty. And those people that are building those offensive weapons, they're going to have to go through not only our stoic, stout defenses, but also a limited amount of money that they can use to propagate this war. And time is on the side of the defender. And I think that that's completely opposite to what we have now, where we do have total war from the war, from the early world wars to even now. Uh, and I just think that a hard money system uh, would 
enable life to live more peacefully and it would uh it would discourage war which would in- essentially incentivize peace couldn't agree more absolutely love it okay one of my favorite thing about bitcoiners is the range of bitcoin's interest and here we are you did touch on bitcoin ballers earlier so maybe give some people to tldr but also i just recently kind of become a fan of basketball in general so two questions what is bitcoin ballers and who's going to win the nba finals (laughs) Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll try to brush on this quickly. So Q and I, Q, who uh, used to work for Bitcoin Magazine, he's, you often see, see him on the news desk at the Bitcoin conference. Great, great with the microphone, good podcaster. He, he reached out to me uh, as a pretty local neighbor. We kind of live close to each other. It's like, hey, you know, you know, I like your spins on basketball. You know, you used to play college. You know, I, I grew up loving it. I play, he played, I think he played high school. But he's like, you want to you wanna do a podcast together? I'm like, anytime, bro. Um, and so we, we started doing it under his banner, uh, running Bitcoin productions uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, it's fun. It's fun sharing the stage, sharing the sharing conversations with people you already know have a have that similar worldview and i talked about this with the conference you already know everyone at the conference loves bitcoin uh now let's move on to other things now we we know people fight about stuff that's beside the point you know bitcoiners are never going to be perfect this isn't heaven but uh we find this this commonality not only on bitcoin but now on basketball we are able to vibe even more we are able to draw throw uh, little hints of Bit- hyper Bitcoinization in our podcast. Uh, we're able to bring on Bitcoiners that love basketball as well. Uh, uh, we just just yesterday or two days ago we had Corey Clipston on, uh, and he was able to talk to keep up with both of us with all our analytics and our perspectives. Uh, great great guy to have on. He was he was retweeting the show. So it's I think in general. Uh, as Bitcoin becomes more mainstream, the Bitcoins, the simply, I, it's so funny, the simply Bitcoin podcast will become legacy. And it's like, yeah, of course, Bitcoin, Bitcoin is is normal. But we would jump from that and have derivatives of different topics. And we already see that, you know, when you have when you talk about uh, the uh, the beef beef and Bitcoin, uh, the uh, Texas Slim. Uh, incorporating Bitcoin with diet. There's a lot of people incorporating Bitcoin with with agrarianism and farming. Uh, I do think that Bitcoin could have an impact on entertainment, sports, uh, in a way that's not just hey, we we like Bitcoin and we and we talk about sports, but more so, how does hard money affect the sports economy? I wrote a piece about that. Uh, how does how do how does Bitcoin change people's philosophy on where players should play uh, and why players should, you know, why con- how contracts should be written. Uh, it brings in a lot of economics philosophies about sports that are kind of swept under the rug to keep it uh, lowbrow entertainment. I don't think sports only needs to be lowbrow. And to answer your last question, I do believe that Denver uh, being a, a team with a, a, gr- a sizable chemistry been the same team for about three years uh finally injury free Jokic is just a massive efficient tank uh i do see that denver is going to uh win this series in five i do believe that miami's a good team uh shout out to all the miami bitcoiners uh i remember being at the conference when they were you know i could see people cheering you know when miami was uh winning the conference finals but oh, I'm sorry, Nico. I mean, <laughs> as an eight seed, they have a great story, but their story is going to end as Eastern Conference champions. Jimmy Buckets. Jimmy Buckets is tired. And, Jimmy Buckets. And it is shown. I wish, hey, if he puts up 50 points in the next three games, I'll eat my words. And if anyone would were to surprise me, uh, it's the and if it were to be the Miami Heat, I would say, you know what? They deserve it but I just think that they've run out of gas. Denver in five. Let's see. Let's see what happens. We'll stay tuned guys. Check out, uh, sir Ulrich's, uh, sir Ulrich's podcast, which he does with Q Bitcoin ballers, big fan already. And we're going to have Q on hopefully very, very, very soon. Ulrich, thank you so much for coming on, but we still got the best segment of the show. We got the cult. We got the meme review. Let's check it out. Meme review. 
the daily meme review. Brought to you by Kaboom Racks. I get this question all the time. Nico, where should I buy Bitcoin miners? The answer is Kaboom Racks. It's the best place to buy Bitcoin miners. That's where you're going to find the best deals and the best prices. Start your mining utopia today. To check out their racks, you got to go to t.me slash Kaboom Racks. Join their Telegram group and start your mining journey today. Kaboom Racks. Kaboom. Kaboom. <sighs> All right, you guys already know the deal. This is the meme review. This is your favorite portion of the show where you tag us on Twitter, giving us memes. You drop them in our Telegram group, and we do our best to get as many memes up here as possible. Tweet to the bullets. Memes are the artillery. As you can tell, we are in an information war. And putting your hat in the ring, spreading the Bitcoin signal far and wide is the most important thing we can do so we can wake people up so that they can hold Bitcoin in self-custody and so they understand exactly what is going on. Ridicule the corporate press, make your friends laugh, keep their morale up, and get the calls of action so people save in Bitcoin. This is the way. Anyways, this first meme, shouts out to our boy Chairforce, aka at Chairforce underscore BTC. And I think he pretty much sums up what's been happening on Twitter to all of us, quote unquote, Bitcoin maxi laser eyed cult members. Uh, we have a Bitcoiner over here and he's watching people in their rowboats going off the cliff, off the waterfall. And he goes, hey, be careful. You're buying unregistered securities. And then we got one of them that goes, Bitcoiners are mean. My VC buddies agree that Bitcoiners are mean. And then we got another shit corner that goes fucking status and then we have one going off the cliff and he goes bitcoin is next we're all in this together absolutely wrecked okay this next one is very interesting so apparently uh jeremy allaire he is uh the ceo of circle he is on the forbes cover and he this the the meme isn't the forbes cover though it kind of is if you if you're a bitcoiner like me and it's got his face he's looking very you know very concerned and looking deep in your soul and it gets forbes please regulate us as crypto exchanges come under fire from regulators stablecoin issuer circle is begging congress for road rules and we got dylan leclerc over here which is the memes the memes are dylan leclerc's take which is just simply cbdc and then we have the double down of it and we got bitcoin is saving shouts out to that account one of the best on twitter goes usdc is a cbdc yikes it's very interesting to have this conversation all week on twitter and having shit coiners call a status and then the shit coiners come out begging for a regulatory moat and begging for regulation so that they can have a clear road ahead uh sheesh anyways doubling down on that forbes cover we have yellow over here and it goes congrats on being the official fed coin and apparently uh the world economic forum just endorsed jeremy allaire and circle posted about it so jeremy allaire co-founder chairman and ceo of circle is a world economic we've approved person couldn't make up happening on the same day absolutely amazing okay and you know me uh anytime we can make fun of some shit coiners on the show i i i take my uh i take my chances on the meme review okay we got this one by stack chain boot and it goes looks like we're spinning the wheel today and we got nick carter crying over here with udi wizard and it goes wheel of blame uh all the options are bitcoin maximalists they always blame us for their problems because they are shilling shit to their audience and we're we're the we're the assholes we're the mean ones here uh anyways we got greg zaj uno over here and he goes at bit bitstein is on the right like everything is a scam and this is again doubling down on the idea we have the classic uh shit or the bus where the one side person's looking at the bright orange future and the other side he's looking at a wall and he's sad and the sad side he's sad he goes everything is a scam i'm getting rug pulled i'm buying all these shit coins are going to zero i'm getting uh my favorite shit coin is just called an unregistered security by the sec and he's super sad about it and then we got the bitcoiner or aka bit scene on the right and he goes everything is a scam we've been telling you this for a while and it's a beautiful beautiful world because it's so simple when you're a bitcoiner just be Bitcoin only. It's it's so much easier. It's such a simple life. Simplify your life. Anyways, this next meme is by Lena C. Shane. She goes, Bitcoin doesn't care. So let's zoom in on this little hodler, 168. 
We got a Bitcoin logo and we got the pump and dump houses blowing up and the exit scans blowing up and they're on fire. And the Bitcoin logo, the little Bitcoin just is unfazed, just walking through the street. And then the next scene, we have media FUD from the corporate press and all the misinformation regarding Bitcoin mining and how we're boiling the oceans and Bitcoin just unaffected, just chilling, walking through the street. And then we got some government attacks on the little Bitcoin hodler and lawsuits and maybe the China ban and Bitcoin just doesn't care and he's just still smiling through the street and then bitcoin gets bigger and it just grows a little bit even through the government attacks and the exit scams and the media fud it's eating all the inflation it's eating all the inflation and then bitcoin just walks into a nice little warm house and <laughs> the bitcoin uh a friend of the bitcoin logo a friend of the bitcoin network aka you guys the bitcoin hodler there's i saw the news how was your day his concerned wife if bitcoin was a uh, a person and he's just like it's as usual you know same 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 day different toilet you already know the deal okay and this next one on that vein shouts out to bold bitcoin on twitter and it goes true bitcoin story and i forget what what who the characters are i'm pretty sure yeah you guys know me. I'm pretty bad at popular culture over here. But we have the Bitcoin and we it the is popular culture. I dude, I don't watch TV anymore really. Anyways, <laughs> uh we have this girl. I think this is like Batwoman or something. I don't know. She's got horn, leather horn mask thing on her. And uh she's the Bitcoin logo and it goes, I went up two hundred and seventy four thousand two hundred and thirteen percent and I get called volatile. And then we got this guy. I think this is like the magician wizard guy, and he goes <laughs> I, and he's the dollar and he goes, I went down negative 22% and get called a store of value. And then the girl responds, that doesn't seem fair, huh? <laughs> this is how you make super villains is by fighting Bitcoin and endorsing the dollar and making us all evil, psychopathic, illiterate Bitcoin cult, laser eyed cult members, whatever. I don't even remember how many names we've been called. All I want to do is save enough money that doesn't steal from me. Is that so much to ask? Sheesh. Sheesh. Okay, drop your meme review score in the chat as we cover hours live. Okay, I think I've done this one, maybe. But it's not just one Simply Bitcoin sticker, not just two Simply Bitcoin stickers. It is three of the last Simply Bitcoin stickers that I have, and I'm not giving these ones out because... Last time I we we did this stuff, I don't have my own merch. So three simply Bitcoin stickers. I don't I'm gonna keep them mint. 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 Anyway, Sir Ulrich, what would you give those memes? Last time I was on the show, I gave the memes one orange pill pack unopened from Pacific Bitcoin that has been skyrocketing like a like we're in like we're post having. But this meme review, I'm giving it not only one pack, but a whale pack from Oof. the Bitcoin conference in Miami a couple weeks ago. And Opti, I know you like to open these things immediately. I'm just going to let these simmer. Perfect. Dude, okay. I am I am like the epitome of curiosity kills the cat. I, I like look at him. I'm like, I just want to know what I have. I, I lower I'm like, your time. I know. I dude, brother. I've never been good with cards. I just I don't I don't get it. I'm like, I think the excitement is the like the best part is <laughs> opening so it up. It's just like look at my cards. I'm a po I'm a I'm an ex Pokemon addict, so forgive me. I that was my excitement is you get a bunch of packs of Pokemon cards and you open them up and you you like, oh I got them. The Charizard, the holographic Charizard. I'm sorry, I, d I don't know how to collect cards. This is something I'll never, I'll never get. Opti dated Chrissy, and all of a sudden, uh, you know, he high just, time uh, preference. He just that that's why Chrissy broke Wait, up with him. Chrissy would be low time preference, though. If you know, you know. Anyways, I'm going to give it uh, <laughs> this Miami beefsteak hat, which I have, but this is the beefsteak two hat. I'm going to give it the beefsteak, Miami beefsteak three. And apparently it's going to be the last one because the Bitcoin conference is going to be in Nashville right. next year. Anyways, before we get to the scores, I want to give a very special shout out to our awesome clothing sponsor. Opti and I wear the merch every single day. ReprezentLTD.com. I'm wearing the classic represent hoodie. Opti's wearing the Bitcoin merch, the angel with the Bitcoin bag and the AK-47. Thank I think it's and, a Tommy gun. And guys, I got something for you. I if know, you it's scan an the QR code on your screen, it will take you to representltd.com where you can get yourself a classic Simply Bitcoin snapback hoodie. It's freaking awesome. Hat. It's high it's quality. A it's a hat. What did I say? 
snapback hoodie. Oh yeah, that th- those don't exist. It's it's definitely yet. a hat. It's definitely a hat. It's He's definitely saying a yet. Hat. <laughs> yet, right? I wonder what that's gonna look like. Anyways, Opti, let's get through some of the scores. But few, first, let's cue the music. A rave elevator uh, gives a beautiful Bitcoin orange cloud over New York City's hashtag. Uh, that's savage. incredible. Those pictures are insane. Chrissy, Chrissy's inscription, Opti Chrissy forever. Opti's mustache on Ulrich. If he ever goes down on a. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Opti, we got him, boys. Opti's filter is terrible. <laughs> Elaine, I did that one on purpose. Elaine, Bitcoin ends endless wars. Absolutely beautiful. Um, Phil C, I give these memes 10,000 sats of optimism. Very, very nice. Very, very nice. And we got uh, whale tacos. I give the memes the final evolution of Bulbasaur. Oof. If you know, you know. Winekiss. <laughs> Winekiss. I give the memes Jimmy Buckets dropping one knack 69 in game four. We got Dang. that bet, Winekiss. <laughs> Dang. Winekiss. He dropped one knack for one knack. Winekiss, the, the simply Bitcoiner at large. If you know, you know. And uh, Justin gives, I give these memes a trip to Tampa to hang out with Bitcoin Bay. All right, next one. Uh, wait, hold on. Uh, the next one. Sorry. <laughs> hey, it's because we're out no, of time. No, we, we, we ran out. We, we ran, ran out. out of time. We ran out, but... Yeah, we ran out of time. Anyways, guys, make sure to join Simply Bitcoin's Telegram group. It's absolutely free. Darth, uh, Darth Coin, our mod over there, our Darth mod, he hosts a the version of Twitter Spaces, but on Telegram every weekend. So he's holding it down. It's absolutely free. Go to www.t.me slash Simply Bitcoin TV. And also check out the written version of this show, which hopefully Sir Ulrich uh, could write us an article one day. Uh, you got to go to www.simplybitcoin.news. And if, if, if you feel so inclined, uh, you could subscribe to us and help us stay on the air. So Sir Ulrich, thank you so much for coming on Simply Bitcoin coin today we really really appreciate you man uh you guys could follow sir rick at uh how do you say that how do you say your it's handle at kobe duran abby at Co- Ooh, i love that wow uh but thanks okay. man so much for joining us wait, today. wait wait before we go nico uh the audience was asking Ulrich where they can find your writing so uh plug yeah. it right now yeah, uh, SirUlrich.com uh, launched my site in January. It basically pulls all my writings from all the different platforms onto that site. I'll try to not be lazy and update it more often than once every three months, but at least everything up to February is there. And uh, you can find my writings, my podcasts, um, and it's a it's a pretty good site. Check it out. Show me some love. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us today, man. We really, really appreciate it. And guys, if you want to hang out in the after party, make sure to join our Twitter spaces, which we co-host with our friends over at swan.com. Best place to build your Bitcoin stack. Shout out to the best producer in the game, producer Jacob. And we're going to be holding it down until 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But until then, we'll be back with the live show tomorrow, 12, 15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Smash that like button. We'll see you tomorrow, guys. Peace out. I get to do it twice a day. Hopefully, I make you guys like spill your coffee or something. Anyways, you already know the deal. This is a Bitcoin space by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners. So come up here, add your two sats to the conversation, or I don't know, maybe some crazy stuff has happened on Twitter and we can cover that as well. Or actually, uh, I do have a few friends up here already, and I did catch Cafe B.